Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Next, we are going to talk about um, the ordinary least squares. Um, so, while doing this course, I would assume that you have some knowledge of regressions and the ordinary least square regressions at least. Uh, what we would do is, we would try to summarize what you have uh, possibly seen before or learned before in ordinary least squares and try to understand where or which assumption we are working on particularly and what is the most important part of ordinary least squares that we are going to focus on in this particular course. So, let us start by um, looking at uh, just reviewing what ordinary least squares means. So, OLS is the method for estimating the unknown parameters in a linear regression model. So, when we say linear, what we mean is that the regression is linear in parameters. We not necessarily mean that they are not uh, they are linear in variables. In the variables, for instance, that suppose we are talking about a regression uh, with y as the dependent variable, and uh, so we have two independent variables x1 and x2. So, the regression takes a linear form of this sort. So, what we imply here is that a linear regression in parameters means that the regression is linear in alpha, beta 1 and beta 2, but they need not be linear in x 1 and x 2. We could also have a regression which has quadratic terms in let us say x 1 and a linear term in x 2 but this would still be linear in parameters. So, this is what we mean by linear um, linearity of the regression. Now, the, uh, the different assumptions of OLS that um, we are going to review are, um, are the fact that the regression that we just saw they are linear in parameters one. Second is that uh, the sample on which the regression is run is a random sample of n observations such that n the total number of observations that you have should be greater than the number of parameters that you are estimating let us say k. So, it should always be the case that n is greater than k otherwise you cannot estimate those parameters. Then the third assumption which is possibly the most important assumption when it comes to the bias or the consistency of the OLS estimator. And we are going to talk more about this for the entire duration of the course. So, which is the zero conditional mean of the error. So, what does it mean? It just means that the error term that you saw in the regression I wrote yeah, the, which is the u, the expectation of this error term is zero which is part 1 and part 2 is that the expectation of u given x which is conditional on the independent variables is also zero. And then comes the assumption of no perfect collinearity which means that the x 1 and x 2 and the number of independent variables that you have they are not collinear between themselves and the fifth assumption of homoscedasticity of the error terms which means that the errors follow a uh, normal distribution with the errors follow normal distribution with mean 0 and the variance is sigma square which means that the variance does not vary with the observation that we are talking about over here. Okay. So, given this what we would do is we would move on to the particularly the zero conditional mean assumption that I was talking about in the previous slide. So, what we have here as I told you is that we want expectation of u to be equal to 0 and the conditional expectation of u that is expectation of u given x must be equal to 0 which leads to the unbiasedness of the OLS estimator. Okay. So, why do we want uh, the unbiasedness of the OLS estimator? The idea is that what I have told you before also that the uh, main thrust of this course is on causality as opposed to correlation. 
And the idea is that when we are talking about correlation, we it could be pointing in the wrong direction in terms of the relationship between y and x. So, suppose we are interested in whether x causes y and you are running an OLS estimate uh, which is a linear regression model and it turns out to be the case that not all assumptions are valid. So, particularly suppose that the uh, conditional independence assumption which we just saw it fails. In that case what we would find is we might end up with a positive or a negative significant correlation between y and x, but in the end we do not know whether it is x which causes y or y which causes x or there is a completely third variable z which causes both x and y and that is leading to the spurious relationship that we see between y and x. So, what we are going to do now is just to have an overview of what are these other things that could uh, or these other situations where we could um, end up with a with a with a significant correlation between y and x, but which is not actually causal. So, some of the um, cases that um, that you can think of are where x is endogenous are the cases of simultaneity biases, the cases of unobserved heterogeneity, case of measurement error in um, x particularly in the independent variable. We are going to discuss this in the course um, of time and uh, there could be another possibility of a selectivity bias that the sample on which you are regressing um, the y on x uh, or x on y the, that sample itself is um, a selected sample. So, we are going to start by discussing just uh, take an example of the case of the simultaneity bias which is traditionally used in um, uh, economics the, uh, the example of demand and supply where you are trying to estimate the elasticity of demand. So, consider the following example suppose um, a particular coffee company we can take any of them let us say um, we have um, uh, cafe coffee day. Uh, uh, right now there are a lot of branches of cafe coffee day that you see in India um, across various cities um, across uh, across India and suppose a new coffee company let us say Starbucks for instance. So, Starbucks wants to enter the Indian market and wants to understand how to price its product and also wants to understand where to enter in the Indian market. Now, it is possible that um, uh, Starbucks when it tries to understand this decision, it hires researchers like you, uh, uh, so uh, doing marketing research and they want to they want an answer from you in terms of what should be the price of a Starbucks cup of coffee in let us say Bombay or in Calcutta or in Bangalore in various parts of the country and where exactly should it place uh, should it enter the market for profitability of course. We always assume in economics that firms are driven by profitability motives. So, the data that Starbucks will have in front of um, uh, a, a to analyze is essentially the data on the number of coffee sales in various parts of the country let us say from CCD from cafe coffee day and the different prices that uh, that is there and the number of customers buying these cups of coffee. So, suppose you want to understand that what is the relationship between um, uh, price and quantity which is the typical demand e equation. So, what we have on the slides that you see is uh, the demand equation where d i is the quantity demanded, p i is the price um, and you can think of i as uh, different markets over here and, uh, and then you also have the supply side of uh, the which is the coffee supply where supply is a positive function of p i as you know from supply demand theory. Now, the point is Starbucks is interested in estimating the aggregate demand function which is how is pricing related to the quantity demanded of coffee. But the problem is when it comes when it uh, it comes to the data available with Starbucks it only has the equilibrium data meaning that it has the data on the prices and what is the equilibrium supply and demand of coffee because that is where the market clear uh, cleared and that is where a particular customer went and bought a cup, cup of coffee. So, what you end up doing is you end up with estimating. Um, the equality of the supply and demand equation 
So, you end up with estimating um, an intersection of the supply and so you end up with estimating an intersection of the supply and demand equations and then what you have is um, an estimate of y which is a combination of the supply and demand equation and estimate of um, so the effect of p i on y i which is a combination of the supply and demand equations. So, what you have finally, is the correlation between y and uh, p but this does not necessarily mean that this relationship is either coming from the demand side or coming from the supply side. What you have in the end as you see from the equation this is just uh, solving the two equations simultaneously what you have in the equation is a weighted average of the two parameters the supply parameter beta and the demand parameter b. What I am trying to uh, say is the following. So, suppose you have price and quantity um, data. So, what you will see is a lot of points which are all the market clearing points from the different markets that you have which is i in the regressions that you saw and what is the equilibrium price and quantity in these different markets. Now, when you try to fit a linear regression through these points these scatters what you might end up with is a positive line. What you could also end up with is no relationship between p and q at all depending on how these points are scattered. But the problem is that in the end you do not know whether it is coming from the demand side or whether it is coming from the supply side because these are all equilibrium points. So, what we are trying to say here is that what you end up by estimating the equilibrium quantity and price is not necessarily the demand elasticity it is just showing you the correlation between price and quantity which could come either from the supply side or from the demand side and it, it is just an equilibrium situation. But what you need in order to estimate the uh, uh, demand equation is you need supply shifters. In other words we know that as supply shifts so, that is a problem and we are going to see again when we are talking about instrumental variables for instance we are going to see how we can address this problem and still estimate the demand function by using an econometric method which is called the instrumental variable strategy. But we will get to that later all we need to understand now is this difference that we are trying to uh, make uh, between uh, correlation and causality. So, uh, just to sum up what I just said. Empirical research is most valuable when it uses data to answer specific causal questions as if in a randomized clinical trial. So, for instance, um, uh, the example that I have given you before uh, in terms of what is uh, what drives productivity whether it is the fixed wage regime that drives um, higher productivity as opposed to the incentive pay or pay for performance. You can think of many such questions and um, try to understand try to answer this causal relationship of in uh, of interest which is we are trying to understand or retrieve the structural model in the sense that when we are talking about the regression equation uh, where y is a function of x then we want to understand whether x drives y that is the question that we are interested in and that we will try to answer in in this course. There are two fundamental approaches in unveiling this structural relationship between x and y. The first one is the structural econometrics which is uh, which was thanks to uh, Judia Parr that uh, we have this approach where they have an economic theory and on the basis of that economic theory the model um, they build a, 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 a set of structural equations which they try to estimate. So, this is uh, essentially based on economic theory and the other one is more is, is actually a theoretic which is thanks to Douglas Rubin who in, introduced these causal models and this is this a theoretic approach is what we are going to use in or what we are going to learn in this particular course the Rubin causal models as uh, they are they are called. So, what does the Rubin causal model try to do? The Rubin causal model is an approach to statistical analysis of cause and effect based on the framework of potential outcomes and the assignment mechanism. 
So, suppose the question is whether attending a private college as opposed to public college, whether that affects your wages or salary when you go out in the market and try to find a job after college. So, suppose that is the question and we need to fix a certain age for you right now because, um, uh, because your salaries are going to also vary by the age. So, suppose what we are asking specifically is that what would be your salary? if you were going to look for a job at the age of 40 had you graduated from a private college as opposed to had you graduated from a public college which is a government college. Now, the point is that in order to understand the causal, causal story, we want to know if you as a person went to a private college what would be your salary and the same person you went instead to this public college what would be your salary. So, we are taking this counterfactual situation or you can think of them as two parallel universes where you would either go to a private college, I could go back in time and put you back in a public college what how would your salaries evolve in the two cases. Now, obviously, when it comes to reality we cannot put we cannot go back in time and put the same person in a different situation. So, what we need to do is come up with different techniques one of them being experiments to recreate this situation or to create what we call the counterfactual. So, constructing the counterfactual in a convincing way is the key to address confoundedness and unveil causality. In other words what I can say is constructing the counterfactual in a convincing way is a key to addressing this conditional independence assumption that you saw before and addressing causality. So, you can think of various questions from your daily life or from um, particular situations in, um, in, in the industry, in businesses, in policy evaluation etcetera. So, for instance, you could think of a question like does class attendance affect performance. So, we are interested in uh, college uh, in, in various colleges students um, uh, randomly bunk classes, they do not come to classes whether attending more classes would improve their performance. You could ask the same question for instance for primary schooling whether if children were attending primary schools would they have better performance. So, for instance, I uh, will give you one example when the midday meal uh, scheme was introduced in India, the school lunches many students started coming to school. So, one of the incentives for people for, uh, to come to school was uh, this free lunch that they were getting and we want to understand whether attending school itself would uh, lead to better um, uh, learning outcomes and uh, we could use econometric techniques to understand this causal story. because. Had it been a correlation, it could be the case that mo the more motivated students are generally coming to school and also have a better performance. So, we do not know whether it is the attendance of these students in school which is leading to a better performance or whether it is just the motivation part of it. So, every time what you should try to think about in order to understand whether it is possible to, un uh, to unveil causality between x and y is to be able to set up an experiment. So, for instance, in the class attendance and performance um, question in the very first question that we have over here, what we would be um, asking is whether we can construct an experiment to answer this particular question. So, suppose you take a group of 100 children, you make 50 of them, you pick 50 of them randomly and make them go to school every day that is their attendance in school. And then the rest of the 50 stays at home and reads the same book uh, again an example that I have given you before and look at their performance at the end of let us say one year. And that is you have been able to at least theoretically construct an experimental situation. Similarly, you could ask whether free school lunches improve enrollment. You could ask whether entrepreneurship training which is very common these days across various business schools um, and various colleges across the world, whether entrepreneurship training leads uh, people to have more successful businesses, more successful startups. Early on if you, uh, if you have seen uh, typically the people who would go for businesses are people who have people in uh, who have their um, 
someone in their family doing a running a successful business or someone in their uh, network of friends and relatives who are running a successful business and they will learn for, from these people and it is easier for them to start a business. Now, the question that we want to answer is if we want more and more people to start a new business which is good for the economy in general and also generates employment, then can we train uh, students in colleges? And can that training lead them to run successful businesses? So, even if a person does not have anyone who is running a business in their family or in the set of friends that they have, we would have more entrepreneurs if we could just train them. So, you, you want to ask the question whether tra uh, entrepreneurship training leads to a more successful business. You could also ask for instance, this is a, a typical question which is asked in um, uh, corporate governance that if CEO salaries are higher, do they lead to higher profitability of the company? Because CEO, CEO salaries have been growing uh, exponentially across the world and uh, what we see is we see a mix of stories in terms of how profitable the co companies are or how successful these companies are. Once again, you can th try to think of experiments theoretically again, not necessarily in reality that you can think of um, increasing CEO salaries in a set of 50 farms out of 100 and randomly picked and you do not increase the salaries of the CEOs in the other 50 firms that you have in your sample. And then you want to see whether there is a difference in the performance of these two types of firms. Now, the qu point is that in reality you might not be able to actually conduct this experiment, but what we are saying here is that at least theoretically can you think of setting up the experiment. So, similarly you can ask for um, college wage premium and you can think of all sorts of stories in your own lives um, that you want to for which you want a causal answer. So, in the, uh, the point is that we are trying to make here is that you are interested in uh, understanding a causal story to each of these questions. You can think of uh, various questions in your lives. Uh, that are important for which you need a causal answer and correlation is um, not what you want to get at. Now, the point is that in uh, for each of these questions what you try to think of is uh, you try to think of a theoretical experiment that you could have constructed and in the absence of the possibility. So, in many of these cases when you for instance when we think of um, do CEO salaries lead to higher profitability, it is tough to think of a situation where you could actually give some CEOs higher salary and you could have a randomized experiment in reality. So, what we want to understand is that first we set up the experiment theoretically and then we try to uh, use econometric techniques in the absence of that experiment to be able to say something about the causal story between CEO salaries and higher profitability uh, through these uh, through using these econometric techniques when we cannot run the experiment in reality. So, what we are trying to uh, do is going back uh, to what I said earlier is we are trying to build this counterfactual what would happen to these companies had CEO salaries not ex increased and what would have happened to these companies had CEO salaries increased in terms of their success rate and that is what we compare in the end. So, ideal experiments are hypothetical as I said in theory you want to um, understand whether you can set up an experiment, but they help us pick fruitful research topics. The idea is that in most cases if you are unable to um, set up an experiment even theoretically, then it is in all probability you would not be able to use any econometric technique to actually unveil this causal story. We are going to look at an experiment um, uh, in the next slide, but before that uh, try to understand that um, the mechanics of an ideal experiment actually highlights which factors are to be manipulated and which factors are to be held constant. So, for instance, in the previous um, case when we were discussing uh, the question of do CEO, do high CEO salaries lead to high profitability? what you are trying to do is you are trying to set up an experiment where you are only manipulating the CEO salaries uh, 
and not anything else. So, you cannot manipulate for instance the quality of CEOs or their past experiences or their educational background. So, these are to be held constant across the companies even the company sizes are to be held constant. So, this is the setting and that is why we call it completely random because the CEO salaries here are not linked to any other characteristics of the CEO themselves or even the firms that we are talking about. So, uh, you should be able to manipulate only the CEO salaries and look at their uh, uh, look at the impact of that particular variation on the profitability of the firm. So, for instance, another example that I will give you from personal economics from uh, human resources is the effect of race or gender. So, there is a lot of discrimination uh, typically found in the labor market. So, uh, for instance, women are paid less salaries than men are for the same job for the same educational background of men and women in many markets across the world and the same is found for various races. For instance, in the US many of the times um, I, I mean there is a there is a long history of research that shows that um, uh, the whites white men in the US actually earn a higher salary than the African Americans in the same market for the same job with the same educational background. Now, the point is that you want to actually understand whether it is a discrimination or whether there is actually something different between men and women that lead men to have higher salaries. So, most of the times it is very difficult to understand or to vary either gender or race experimentally. You cannot just uh, randomly assign race or gender to individuals. So, luckily uh, this uh, particular stream of research what they found is that it is not the gender or the race per se which is important in understanding discrimination, but rather what is the perception of the employer about your gender or your race that matters. So, there have been uh, papers and uh, with the most important and the first one being this Bertrand Mullainathan paper again something that we are going to briefly discuss in uh, the later part of this course. They uh, ran an experiment where they tried to play with the belief of the employer about the uh, race of the person who was applying for the job. And what they found is that in their paper what they find is that there is a positive discrimination in favor of white men in the US market. So, in an experiment you need to understand what is this variable that um, you, you want to manipulate, what is, uh, what is the variable that you want to manipulate. And once you know which variable you want to manipulate in an experiment, what you could do is you can uh, in the absence of uh, an experiment or in the absence of the possibility that you can run an experiment, you can use observational data to approximate a real experiment. So, you could look for strategies in instrumental variables for instance um, and use policy changes, laws, regime changes which we call quasi experiments because they have been um, uh, they have been in use in the entire economy and they have been a result of some policy changes in the economy not as an experiment that, that you have instituted, but what the government or what the particular situation may be an industry has um, introduced as a policy as a uh, law change or a regime change. And that allows you to uh, construct the situation which is similar to an experiment or construct the counterfactual. So, there are many methods for instance that can be used uh, the, the econometric techniques that can be used to um, create a situation which is similar to an experiment to construct a counterfactual. So, some of the methods are the social experiments. So, so, there are many social experiments that are that you can use natural experiments. Uh, so, one example would be for instance in India you have seen that there was a time from where uh, free lunches were introduced in school. So, you could use the fact that free lunches were introduced in various parts of India in various times as we will see later again and um, you want to see whether attendance improved after introducing the school lunches.
right. So, it gives you a natural experiment setting because midday meal was introduced um, uh, in, in various states in various points of time and you want to use that particular experiment which was run by the government to create an experimental situation where you are asking the question uh, let us say whether um, free school lunches actually improve uh, class attendance or you could even ask the question that whether uh, class attendance improves um, learning. Now, when there is a lunch given in the school, uh, the hypothesis here is something that you can also test of course, that whether attendance actually went up due to school lunches and then try to understand whether learning also went up along with it. So, these are uh, natural experiment situations that you exploit or that you use to create a situation which is similar to um, uh, uh, an experiment that you yourself could have run. There are other techniques like matching. Matching is where you are trying to uh, see, uh, trying to match individuals in this particular example of school attendance and learning what you would be doing is you would be matching children who come to school, attend school and uh, children who do not attend school. Now, our basic hypothesis here is that people who come to school just uh, if you have observational data and you are looking at people who have high attendance in school and children who do not have high attendance in school, the problem most of the times is that these are very different children to begin with because it is possible that the children who are attending school regularly have more parental investment in them, parents care more about whether they are attending school and then they are forcing their children to attend school. It could also be the case that these children are more motivated because they are attending school than the children who do not come to school and their learning is better because of this motivation. Uh, what matching allows you to do is that they allow you to match each child who is attending school which is in some sense the treatment group to each child in the control group who is not attending school and try to find a match a closest match in terms of motivation and all other factors that you can think of and once you have a close match then you are trying to say that see if this person which who is very similar to this other child that we have attend school and this other child does not attend school, then what is the learning difference between these two kids? And this is essentially the basic idea behind the Rubin's causal model. And then you can also think of um, other techniques like the instrumental variable design that we will study in this course. Um, uh, you can also have regression discontinuity design, something that we will possibly not be able to cover in the duration of this course. Uh, but are related ideas. So, in addition to this, uh, when we are talking about the uh, coefficient, the, cause, the causality, the causal relationship between x and y, what we are talking about is this coefficient beta on x, which is essentially the relationship between x and y or what uh, if x changes by one unit by how much does y change. Now, this is what we are trying to say here is we want the exact causal relationship in other words we care about the magnitude the perfect magnitude that beta would have that is consist or uh, an unbiased estimate of the true value of this um, coefficient beta. But what we also care about in addition to this magnitude is statistical inference. The answer to this question is about constructing the right standard errors. So, not just the coefficient beta, but the standard error of that coefficient, so that we can um, talk about the confidence interval of that uh, coefficient beta. And often inference becomes complex in survey data. So, when we are using non experimental data or even experimental data for that matter, uh, particularly non experimental data when we have clustered groups as we will see, uh, then um, statistical inference becomes difficult because we also want an unbiased estimate of a standard error. Because suppose that you what you find is that you find that x has a positive impact on y 
which is reflected in a positive coefficient beta and you are pretty sure that you have. So, so if it was an experimental setting uh, which you have randomized then you can be sure that the beta that you are estimating is actually an unbiased estimate or the true parameter beta, but it is also possible that you find an insignificant coefficient. So, you do not know whether the policy or the, um, the, uh, the treatment that you are giving the experimental in the experimental setup whether it has a positive coefficient or whether it has a 0 coefficient because your uh, coefficient is not significant you cannot say anything. So, what we are going to also talk about uh, in this course is uh, statistical inference. So, one more important idea is uh, the nature of the data. So, typically there are two types of um, survey data that you can think of one is uh, you have suppose you have different individuals in the country. So, typically our national sample survey data is of this sort what you do is you go to different households and you survey you ask various individuals questions about their employment, um, their livelihood, um, uh, their education and various other important factors that you are interested in as a researcher. Now, the, uh, the so this is typically called a cross sectional data where you have different individuals on which uh, for, for which you are measuring the same variables. And, um, but when I say individual it need not be the case that each, uh, uh, each observation is an individual it could be the case that each observation in, is an individual a uh, firm or uh, you can think of any other each observation could be an individual, a farm or a district of India for instance um, depending on the question that you are asking. And finally, if the data is not a random sample we have a sample selection problem once again something that we would discuss later. The other type of data that you could have is uh, essentially a time series data where you are you have in uh, information on the same individual or let us say the same district of India over time. So, you have uh, you are not essentially collecting data on n individuals, but you are collecting data only on one individual and observe that same individual over time in different points of time. So, let us say you have 100 uh, time periods on which you observe um, the data for a particular individual. Uh, well, possibly 100 is a bit too much when it comes to an individual because the average uh, lifetime is not 100 years for an individual, but you can think of uh, maybe for a particular state of India you are collecting data or for India itself you are collecting data for 100 years on various um, uh, indicators maybe income indicator like GDP maybe some other institutional indicators anything, but the idea here is that what you have in the data is a time is at different points of time you have different observations not across different cross sectional units. Right? So, these are the two main uh, data types that we have and the third one which is the possibly uh, the most important is where you combine these two ideas of cross sectional units and time series units. So, you can have maybe 100 individuals who you are following over a period of 20 years. So, you have not only a cross section data, but you have a time series on each cross sectional unit what we call a panel data. So, once again a panel data is essentially a, a data which you have a longitudinal data that you have on every cross sectional unit in your sample. Okay. So, uh, you could pull random cross sections and treat them similar to a normal cross section uh, or you could have follow the same random individual observation over time which we call a longitudinal data or a panel data. So, just to summarize what we learned in this discussion today is that um, we again starting from we distinguish between co uh, correlation and causality which is very important we want to ask causal questions and find to try to un uh, find causal answer to those uh, questions and uh, the approach that we are going to take there are two main approaches that you could take one is a structural approach and which is embedded in an economic theory and the other one is uh, an a theoretic approach where you do not have a theory. We are going to follow this second approach which was uh, introduced by Rubin 
where you are essentially trying to construct the right counterfactual in the sense that you go you uh, put an individual into treatment you see what is the outcome of that individual due to the treatment you go back in time put that individual into the control and see what is the outcome of that individual in the control setting and then compare the two settings to say something about the effect of the treatment on the outcome so you can either construct an experiment or what you can do is you can theoretically think of an experiment that you could construct and if it is possible to construct an experiment, but in reality you are not able to construct an experiment, then you can use certain econometric techniques in certain situations to find an answer which your experiment would have given you or uh, set up or, or, or uh, create a setting which is similar to that experiment. And then we discussed that we have different types of data which is cross sectional data time series data and then a combination of the two which is panel data. And uh, then we also discuss that um, it is not only the magnitude or th when we are talking about causality we are mainly concerned about the magnitude of this coefficient in the regression of x on y, but it is not only the magnitude that we care about we also care about the statistical inference whether this relationship is statistically significant or not. So, we would also discuss statistical inference in this course. So, that summarizes an outline or gives you a broad outline of how the rest of the course is going uh, is, is designed. Thank you very much for attending today's session. Mm -hmm.